So it's safe to say Sheffield Wednesday, Plymouth Argyle and Ipswich have all experienced a very different starts to life in the Championship. It's time to check in and delve deep into all three clubs following their promotion from League One. Let's go. As always, if you do find value from the content, please make sure you subscribe. Over 60% of the people that watch the podcast aren't yet subscribed. If that's one of you, please make sure you do that. It helps me reach different audiences and grow the podcast as well. Let's begin with the first club, Sheffield Wednesday. Since my last podcast on them in May, it seems everything that could have gone wrong has gone wrong. I saw firsthand at Wembley Stadium the joy and passion Sheffield Wednesday created when they won promotion at the death. And what we've seen since is an ex-League One club regress so badly. From the man that led them to glory walking away to his successor already being given the boot and the chairman calling out one of the most loyal fan bases in England, it's been a pathetic circus. <laughs> So what's happened since we last spoke about Sheffield Wednesday? Well, in short, a lot. I call it the eight headlines to disaster. For context, when I first started planning for this episode, there were five headlines. Things seem to get worse and develop every day. Let's start with headline number one. Darren Moore leaves the football club. Chanziri calls out Darren Moore after his departure is confirmed. Munier Cisco is appointed as manager. An extremely tedious summer window commences. Chanziri then calls out Darren Moore again, this time bringing up confidential wage figures. A crazy club statement, that one. The chairman then slams the fans and announces he will not provide any more funds. Sheffield Wednesday remain winless after 11 games, picking up only three points for a possible 33. A terrible start on the pitch. Cisco is inevitably sacked and a search for a new manager begins and probably 10,000 words more in club statement form and we're up to date. Now, the first thing that comes to mind is the damage culture at Sheffield Wednesday after that magical night at Hillsborough in the second leg against Peterborough. The word spirit was used so often. It was evidently clear that the players would run through brick walls for ex-manager Darren Moore and the belief that the dressing room got them over the line. When such a popular figure leaves a football club, the mental come down and ability to prepare for a new season is made so much harder. That strong culture that Darren Moore created looks already completely shattered, not just because of the managerial change itself, but from top to bottom, that club has some serious issues. We're talking from the hierarchy at ownership level down to the playing and coaching staff. Some people won't like hearing this about professional footballers, but do you think Sheffield Wednesday is a nice place to work right now? From just what we know as the public, do you think that current club culture allows individuals to operate to their best ability? I think the answer is no to both of those questions. So what now for Sheffield Wednesday and where do they go from here? The most significant next step is the appointment of a new manager, whether that be a short-term solution or a long-term one. The confidence is at an all-time low, so bringing a feel-good factor to the playing squad seems to be the first step in the right direction when that manager comes in. If anything, a positive bridge must be created between the players, the manager and the fans. The chairman's relationship is completely over, but the supporters must ride the wave with the playing and coaching staff to give them a fighting chance. That's a bare minimum, much easier said than done when results and performances have been well below par, but it's important and another important job for that next coach. Chanziri won't but should take the large majority of blame for the downfall. There's no coming back from this now. The relationship is over, it's toxic, it's damaging and it's getting worse. Chanziri has behaved so childishly and almost incompetently through what was such an important and big transition following promotion to the championship. In those moments, you need people to step up and show leadership and a clear direction and that certainly didn't happen. His self-centred desire has cost him and potentially Sheffield Wednesday's championship status as well. I feel so sorry for those supporters. Plymouth's promotion story was a fantastic blueprint for years to come and gave teams with a specific strategy the chance to dream. From a heavily statistical recruitment method to a culture built on ultimate belief, Plymouth achieved one of the best success stories in Football League and definitely League One history. 
So what's happened since we last spoke about Plymouth? Well, an ambitious summer window follow, breaking their transfer record twice in that first window following promotion. The permanent additions of Morgan Whitaker, Bally Mumba show how Plymouth are financially willing to own proven young talent and build for the long term as well as the short term. It's been a mixed start to the season with some brilliant results and some not so brilliant ones, beating Norwich 6-2, Blackburn 3-0, Huddersfield 3-1. They are showing when they fire on all cylinders, they're a real force to be reckoned with. They currently sit second for open play goals and second for open play shots, only behind fellow newly promoted boys Ipswich Town. The problem tends to lie at the back. Six defeats so far this season, 1.7 goals conceded per 90 and in the games in which they've lost, they're averaging 2.5 goals against. They're currently second for most shots conceded and third for the highest XG conceded too. Last season, the domination of Plymouth meant that attack was almost the best form of defence, but with the attacking quality difference and improvement in the championship ultimately, they found they've been rather exposed at certain points. Let's take a look at their standout performance this season. A 6-2 win over Norwich City, a promotion favourite of course as well. In a game in which they had 31% of the ball, they accumulated an XG of 3.31 and of course scored 6 goals. The second half is even more telling. They only managed 27% of the ball but created 3 big chances and again converted another 3. The possession being conceded can also be visualised when looking at the trusty graph. Plymouth fans coming back to the podcast after a little while, you would have missed this. This is the attacking momentum graph brought to you by SofaScore. Particularly in the second half, Norwich were on top, but were still punished when Plymouth scored three out of their four shots on target post the break. This could be further emphasised when looking at direct attacks. They currently sit second with 28, much higher than their number last season. Stephen Schumacher has accepted the ultimate control tactic, can't all always be replicated but with a clinical edge up top and clear-cut chances carved out with fewer moments games can still be won very convincingly So going forward, what's next for Plymouth? First and foremost, it's been a very steady start to the season, but consistency is the next step. Plymouth have proven they have a real level of dangerous ability and they've done it and we've seen it on many occasions so far, but doing it on a more consistent basis will obviously increase their chances of a very respectable finish. Plug those holes at the back and remain very strong and threatening going forward. Home Park will remain an optimistic place to watch the football. Last season, 101 goals, 98 points and probably one of the best ever sized to feature in Skybet League One. It's safe to say the feel-good factor has remained at Portman Road as the Tractor Boys dream of the Premier League. Unbelievable. <laughs> So what's happened since we last spoke about Ipswich? Well, another very aggressive window followed with key targets being sorted in the early stages of the summer. January target, Jack Taylor joined with popular striker George Hurst for a combined fee of around 3 million as a low market was also used effectively too. Brandon Williams, Dane Scarlett and Murray Hutchinson all joined from Premier League clubs on a temporary basis, really bolstering the strength and depth because... They weren't already strong in depth. But interestingly, even with those new additions, the starting 11 remains very similar to last season. Continuity has been a big reason for their very strong start to the campaign. But when the season started, the optimism only grew. The biggest similarity is the habit of winning has certainly not disappeared. From a possible 33, they've accumulated 28 points. After just 11 games, they have an eight point cushion in the automatic promotion places in the Skybet Championship. Statistically, they're topping so many charts, especially in the attacking third. Most goals scored with 25, most open play shots taken with 151, second most set play goals scored with five as well. Kieran McKenna hasn't changed his approach. He remains wanting his side to dominate the ball, particularly in those central areas, allowing the room for the likes of Leif Davis to create from wide. And speaking of Leif Davis, his form has only got better following the promotion. So far this season, he's managed five assists from an expected 1.97, 3.5 key passes, two big chances, and the most progressive carries ending with an assist. His season heat map shows how advanced he finds himself on the left-hand side, dominating the opposition flank. His left-sided overloads caused endless problems in League One last season, and it's been no different in the championship this time around. 
McKenna isn't afraid to play with a high direct speed and wants his players to get those attacking players on the board as quickly as possible using that midfield pivot brilliantly. This graph brought to you by the analyst reinforces a unique style visualizing how the Tractor Boys have the highest direct speed in the league with 2.09 seconds but still tend to favor a reasonable number of passes per sequence. Let's touch on a standout showing. Picking just one is really difficult, but I've gone with the 3-0 win over Hull City. That felt like a real statement. A Hull City side with such high aspirations and a very steady start to the season were demolished by Kieran McKenna's team. Let's break it down. Firstly, the ball possession was equal, but the attacking rhythm fell in the favour of Ipswich all night, with the common but unstoppable identity in full swing. Hull City created two big chances with Haldaki in exceptional form and a goal preventing XG of 1.09 in this match. The clean sheet remained completely intact. The second goal is a perfect example of this Ipswich side at their best. A progressive ball into the advanced Leaf Davis, who finds Connor Chaplin unmarked on the edge of the box with an exquisite finish for the goal. It was total football last season and it's no different for Ipswich this time around. It's brilliant to see a side not change their way but continue to be a fantastic force. So what now for Ipswich? It sounds stupidly obvious but they've set the bar so high and proved how incredible they can perform against any opposition. If they can remain consistent there is no reason why this side can't pull off a magical footballing story. They've got the manager, they've got the players, they've got the ambitious ownership and they've got the fan base. When all four pull together success is made far easier. So that's every team wrapped up in real detail. The three promoted sides from last season, Sheffield Wednesday, Plymouth Argyle and Ipswich. Hopefully you did enjoy the content. It's great to have, hopefully, the community back in the comments below. If you did enjoy it, please make sure you subscribe and leave a like. We've delved deep into how the teams have fared in the league above. The ugly, the steady and the brilliant. Thank you very much. I'll see you all very, very soon. Take care.